Welcome back. Covering time period three, which you can see here is uh, regional and interregional interactions. And uh, our time periods from here on out are CE, the Common Era. So this is 600 CE to 1450 CE, what used to be referred to as the post-classical era, um, sometimes still referred to that um, by historians today, although that's kind of fallen out of vogue. But so this is the time period after these great classical empires have fallen. And what we're going to see here is that some empires have um, risen up to take their place, uh, but in many regions of the world, this has not come to pass. Uh, so that's what we'll be taking a look at in this unit. So some big picture themes for the, uh, the time period here. Tremendous growth in trade. We saw this during the classical era. It's really going to accelerate now in the, in the post-classical era. Uh, primarily due to improvements in technology, also the safety of a lot of these trade routes, uh, which we'll take a look at in Key Concept 3.1. So major technological developments, which I mentioned, that's also Key Concept 3.1. We also see some pretty large movement of peoples, and uh, I'm thinking mostly in Eurasia and Africa, but this is happening in the Americas too. This is greatly altering the world, especially when you um, factor in the spread of Islam in the 7th and 8th centuries. And uh, yeah, just tons and tons of changes that are going on as this, this technology facilitates not just trade, but also the movement of peoples. Uh, religion preached equality to all before God. Religion, codified religion, is going to become even more important than it has been so far in our course. I already mentioned the creation of Islam in the seventh century, but um, Christianity, Buddhism, Hinduism, these religions continue to uh, spread, especially Christianity, as we'll take a look at. So this acted as a unifying force connecting the regions together. Uh, if we go back, go back to this real quickly, notice interregional interactions, not just regional anymore, but now we're into interregional interactions, interactions between regions. Um, spread of religion and trade is acting as a unifying force as this diaspora occurs. Uh, and number six, political structures of many areas adapted and changed to the new conditions of the world. These new conditions brought on by the collapse of centralizing forces in places all across Eurasia, less so in the Americas, but all across Eurasia. And so political structures of many of these areas are going to adapt. In some areas, we'll see decentralized structures emerge, like feudal societies in Europe, Western Europe, and Japan. In some areas, we'll see new empires rise and fall during this time period. So there's a lot going on here. So key concept 3.1, the deepening and widening of human interactions. Long distance trade is kind of the story of this time period as far as I'm concerned. The Silk Road certainly existed in the classical era in the previous time period, but a lot of the trade that occurred tended to be regional. You had merchants and traders who were hopping from one town to the next and going back and forth. We still have a lot of that in the post-classical era, but I think what you're going to see is the um, technological improvements are allowing merchants to travel farther than they ever could. And so we're seeing more long distance trade that didn't exist really in the classical era. So the Silk Roads um, still exist and they expand. Um, the Silk Roads spanning most of Eurasia up here in the red. Rem remember that these are a network of roads. Often they're referred to in the singular, the Silk Road. I always try to refer to them in the plural, the Silk Roads. We see, especially during the later part of this time period, that the Silk Roads are going to benefit from big empires. The Mongol Empire in the 13th century is going to bring a relative stability to this entire region for about 100 years, and that's going to facilitate long-distance trade. Um, the Islamic Caliphate, also in the 7th and 8th centuries, which is going to be right around this area, um, think uh, Sahara, Middle East, Persia. This is where the Islamic Caliphates will be. We'll talk about that more in uh, Key Concept 3.2. Again, bringing a lot of stability. Once they sweep through and conquer these regions, um, they bring stability with them. And I already mentioned the Mongol Empire. The caravanserai is a really important term for this time period. And we'll talk about this a little in class. But the caravanserai are uh, these structures. These are, you can think of them as trading depots, basically. And caravanserai 
start to pop up all across Eurasia. These are places where merchants from all different cultures come together to trade um, all their goods that they have. And uh, as you can imagine, this isn't the only thing that's going on because these are people from different regions of the world. They have their own different cultures and different religions and different languages. And so you have this melting pot, as it were, of all of these different people and cultures coming together. And so the caravanserai, which begin to pop up all across Eurasia, I'm thinking most in, in this region here, are super important for this time period. The blue lines uh, represent our ocean trade. We had ocean trade in the classical era, but because of these new improvements in technology, which we'll talk about in a moment, this ocean trade is um, able to go further than ever before. These networks are uh, more robust than they were during the classical era. And we can lump in the Trans-Saharan trade and the Mediterranean trade to the Mediterranean Sea, which has had trade for a long time now. That's, of course, still going on up here. Trans-Saharan trade is trade that is um, traversing the Sahara. The Sahara is this very large desert up here in northern Africa. Trans-Saharan trade is traveling both north to south. OK, so uh, ports up on the Mediterranean Sea traversing the Sahara. Um, to get to what is called sub-Saharan Africa. That's also happening from east to west and vice versa. There's a lot of empires that are popping up here in, in uh, Saharan Africa during the 11th, 12th, 13th, 14th centuries. The Mali Empire, the Ghanaian Empire, um, all, that, all that sort of stuff is helping to facilitate trade. So this is still under Roman numeral one here. So technological improvements which help to facilitate trade. Um, the compass, the south pointing needle, we're not at the north pointing needle yet, but that doesn't really matter because the spread of the compass uh, originated in Asia to other regions of the hemisphere is so important for long distance trade. You can imagine why. Without a compass, uh, you want to stay within sight of land because once you leave land, it's very difficult to navigate. Once you have a compass, now all of a sudden you can trust something that's a little bit more trustworthy than the stars or dead reckoning. Um, ship technology and, and the building of larger ships also improved. Rudders, hulls, sails, um, sailing technology, triangular sails. We're not quite there yet where um, in the next time period, time period four, we'll see um, ships getting even larger and being able to uh, go across the open ocean fairly safely. We're not quite there yet. Towards the end of this time period, 1300s, 1400s, we're getting close with shipbuilding technology, but... Uh, this is very large. I'm thinking like Spanish galleons and stuff like that. That's a little bit later. That's time period four. But nevertheless, when we combine these maritime technological improvements with these overland trading improvements, what we see is a increase in trade both by sea and over land. So the camel saddle, um, stirrups making long distance travel easier for merchants and riders, um, paper and coin money. Too. So um, especially with larger empires, uh, paper and coin money is able to, to spread and uh, that facilitates trade too because it just makes it, uh, makes it easier. And I mean, you can just think about, think about our country today. Um, how would you exchange goods without paper or coin money? Um, and obviously without credit cards. I guess it's kind of difficult to think about that today. Um, but yeah, it would be really difficult. You'd have to barter. You'd have to Put your faith in uh, the person who you are who you are trading with. So paper and coin money is a really important invention for for long distance cross cultural trade. Um, also, if we think about um, trade, trade is dangerous. It always has been, probably always will be to some degree. During this time period, what we see is that merchants are better better able to protect themselves because of improvements in weapon technology, weapons technology. So the short bow, gunpowder is the big one, of course. Um, the Silk Roads have bandits and pirates along the way. Of course, pirates prowling the Mediterranean and the Indian Ocean Basin. Um, so trade is, is dangerous. The ability for merchants to be able to protect themselves is key to this, the spread of trade and the growth of interregional trade. So it's not all just about trade because um, people are people are moving. Merchants are, of course, moving, but they tend to come and go. But during this time period, we're also seeing some pretty large migrations, which are having impacts on the environment as well as language. 
Uh, the College Board likes to ask about this, um, the spread of the Bantu peoples who are moving along the Congo River and further south and east into Africa is an important migration that's happening during this time period. Let me put the map up here to show you. So the Bantu peoples are originating from around the Sahara, just below the Sahara, and they're spreading all across sub-Saharan Africa. Now these migrations uh, are not solely happening in our time period. You can see here they span almost 2,000 years, but in our time period these migrations really accelerate, and so you're going to have this large cultural spread that's uh, occurring during our, our time period, right in the middle of our time period. Um, and that's a very large, very significant migration for Africa and for this time period. The Vikings, um, the Vikings up in pretty much the opposite end of the world are moving along rivers and even oceans into Europe and to the, the New World. Um, I put this in here, you can think of Viking ships as the same as horses of other nomads. Vikings tend to be a seafaring people, and so they are using their their ships, their shipbuilding technology to spread out. These are uh, this kind of a crude map, but I, I like it because it shows possible trade routes of Vikings. We have archaeological evidence of Vikings going all across many of these areas, and you can see here the Vikings are originating up in Scandinavia, but look at how far they're going. They're going all the way out into the Eastern Mediterranean Sea, possibly trading with the Middle East and Central Asia. And this map doesn't even show the Vikings who made it all the way to the other hemisphere, because it's pretty well accepted amongst archaeologists and historians today that Vikings did in fact make it to our hemisphere and did in fact make it to um, Greenland and uh, Nova Scotia. It's pretty impressive for the time. The Turkish people and the Mongols move southward and westward from the steppes of Asia. Steppes meaning um, uh, plains, basically, like elevated plains, uh, S-T-E-P-P-E-S. -E -E and they are spreading violence. <laughs> they are spreading conquest. They are spreading um, their culture. They are also spreading the plague, which we'll talk about a little bit later in the PowerPoint. The Mongol Empire is the significant one here. We'll talk more about this in Key Concept 3.2. But this just shows you how vast the Mongol Empire is, originating in the steppes of Asia and spreading south, spreading east, spreading west, and in a very short time, relatively speaking, 20 to 30 years, the Mongols have raced across all of Asia and united it under these Khanates. And um, it ushers in this golden period for this area. A lot of the Silk Road trade is right along this this empire, once the Mongols have, have captured this, the Silk Roads become uh, safe, relatively safe, safer to traverse. And so the 13th century, we see an acceleration of cross-cultural interactions because of um, the Mongols. Last one to mention are the Polynesian migrations. These are people who, put the map up here, we can see have spread out over a pretty long period of time. If we go back 50,000 BC, we have evidence of humans in Australia. And so during our earlier periods, Polynesian peoples have been hopping island to island. And what we're seeing during our time period is that they are further spreading out, making all the way over to Pitcairn Island, Easter Island. This is Easter Island is pretty close to um, mainland America is pretty co close, relatively speaking. And by relatively speaking, I mean they're getting there in canoes. Pretty impressive. And of course, New Zealand. New Zealand's only been populated by humans, we think, for about a thousand years. So this is happening during our time period as well. Last Roman numeral in Key Concept 3.1 is that cross-cultural exchanges were fostered by the intensification of existing or the creation of new networks of trade and communication. This is where we begin to talk about Islam. Um, Islam, which is based on the revelations of the Prophet Muhammad, develops in the Arabian Peninsula in the early 17th century and spreads rapidly um, so that by the time we get to the 8th century, Islam has spread all across Northern Africa, uh, the Mediterranean Basin, all across Persia, the Middle East. Islam, we're going to take a close look at this in class. I think it's important. Islam um, reflected the beliefs among Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians and it's blending those beliefs together 
with the beliefs of the local Arabian peoples. So if we were to go back to um, the Arabian Peninsula pre-600 CE, Islam doesn't exist. These people tend to be animists or pagans. Um, Islam and the Prophet Muhammad come along and blend these beliefs together with beliefs of Jews, Christians, and Zoroastrians to create a new religion, religion of Islam. And so I already mentioned this, due to military expansion, as well as trade, but military expansion first, Islam expanded um, uh, all across Eurasia um, very rapidly. And we can see that in um, this map. So the Islamic world under Muhammad, um, we can see is confined mostly to the Arabian Peninsula with a, a splinter group over here, over by the Persian Gulf. But very quickly after Muhammad's death, um, the, the caliphs, the leaders of the Islamic community who um, follow Muhammad in succession, spread across uh, the Middle East into Persia and begin spreading across Northern Africa. Uh, and then our first of the named Islamic caliphates, the Umayyad Caliphate, um, which is going to last a little less than 100 years, is going to spread all the way across all of Northern Africa and even into the Iberian Peninsula and Europe. And so you can see here, Islam emerges, 622. Uh, Prophet Muhammad dies, 632. Um, between 622 and 750, just over 100 years, the Islamic world has, um, has spread. And so the spread of religions and trade equals the spread of cultural ideas. I have this little video here, um, which I think is a pretty good video. It shows how Christianity is spreading across the world. Um, so I'll just, uh, I'll just let it play so you can take a look at it. Uh, but I think it does a nice job in a relatively short amount of time of showing how, once Christianity emerges, how and where it spreads. You can see once it's accepted by the Roman Empire in the 4th century. And now we're getting into our time period here, where the Christian world is ensconced in Northern Africa and Western Europe. And we can see with the coming of Islam how the Christian world sink, uh, shrinks. Sorry, and Christianity focuses northward because the Islamic world is now down here, and even in the Iberian Peninsula. And this relates to the Crusades, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Christian Crusades against the Islamic world. And so by the time we get to the end of our time period, sorry, I hit the wrong button there. I stopped the recording, not the video. By the time we get to the end of our time period, we can see that the Christian world here is pretty much just isolated to Western and Eastern Europe because the Ottoman Empire, which we'll talk about next time period, is, is all the way down here. And it's actually starting to push into the Christian world, but uh, that is for another day and another time. So hopefully that video uh, helps a little bit. So Buddhism, Buddhism is spreading in Asia. It's actually getting pushed out of India. Um, and so it's spreading to Southeast Asia. Um, and it's spreading into China, too, although it's uh, spreading into China in the last time period um, as well. We took a look at that with the, uh, the DBQ that we did. Islam spread cultural and religious ideas as it expanded under the Umayyad and the Abbasid Caliphates. Take a look at that in time period, uh, sorry, key concept 3.2. And Confucianism spread as China's influence grew in the East and Southeast Asia. So that's key concept 3.1. Um, which, uh, if I go back there, key concept 3.1 as a reminder is the deepening and widening of human interactions. Migrations of people, spread of empires, but mostly trade. All right, so moving on to key concept 3.2. State formation and development demonstrated continuity, innovation, and diversity in various regions. So we'll take a look at new state formations first. So centralized empires. The Tang and the Song empires in China are good examples of centralized empires. So last time period, we had the Han, the Qin. Those have fallen off those classical empires. Um, and you can see here the Tang dynasty, which lasts for about 300 years, and then the Song dynasty, which lasts for another 300 years. Um, 
really a, a golden age in Chinese history. Um, there's a lot of stability. There's a lot of trade and demand for um, Chinese goods, although that's going to come a little bit later towards the tail end of the Song Dynasty. But there's also a good deal of continuity. You know, the spread of Confucianism. Confucianism is now pretty much entrenched in Chinese society. And going all the way back to the Qin, um, most, uh, I don't want to say most, a lot of the legacy of the Qin is still being carried on by the Tang and Song Dynasty. The Byzantine Empire uh, in the Eastern Mediterranean. Sorry, I went through that pretty quick. Byzantine Empire. So this uh, was the Eastern half of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire fell in the 5th century, the fall of Rome, but the Byzantine Empire continued to exist, Eastern, uh, the Eastern Roman Empire. Um, and we can see here the extent of the empire under Justinian I, uh, which is pre this time period, this during classical era. The Byzantine Empire is shrinking throughout this time period. You can see in the center of our time period around 1020 is that lighter red color. And by the time we get to 1360, the empire has really shrunk. Um, Constantinople is the most important city in Byzantium, in the Byzantine Empire. And uh, its fall in 1453 is one of the reasons why this time period ends around 1450, because it's a seminal moment in the history of uh, Europe and in Christian history as well. So the caliphates um, in, in greater, I went through that pretty fast too, sorry, the Umayyad and Abbasid caliphates in greater Central Asia. So these are our Islamic caliphates. These are our Islamic empires. Remember, it's called a caliphate because it is an empire that is headed by a caliph, the religious leader of Islam. So the caliph is a religious leader, also often a political leader too. So the Umayyad caliphate here, just notice how far this is spreading. Islam only emerges in 622. And so this caliphate is rapidly spreading. And the Abbasid Caliphate is occupying much of the same territory after the fall of the Umayyad. Don't need to be concerned with any of this stuff for the AP exam. These are just the breakdowns of the different bureaucratic structures as they were. You can think of them almost as states um, that are loyal to the caliph. So we have some centralized empires we can see that have replaced the classical empires, but we also have a lot of regions that remain decentralized throughout our time period. Western Europe is the best example here. Japan is also decentralized. Um, you'll see oftentimes the College Board will ask comparative questions between feudal Europe and feudal Japan because there are a lot of similarities during this time period, which we'll talk about in class. So what does it mean to be decentralized? Well, this is this is what it means to be decentralized. Think about this. The classical era, all of this is under one ruler. All of this is under Rome. This is all the Roman Empire, if we were to go back to the classical era. But throughout our time period, once Rome falls, nothing rises up in Europe to replace it as a central unifying force, at least in terms of um, political power. Europe is still unified together through the Christian church. And I'm talking about the Catholic church here, the Roman Catholic church. And so when we look at this, what we see is all these different kingdoms with all these different rulers and princes and lords and all this. They are all, however, still Catholic. They are all still loyal to the Pope, to the papal states down here. Now, this is Western Europe I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Eastern Europe. Eastern Europe is a whole different bag because we have... Um, we have our own branch of Christianity out there, the Eastern Orthodox Christian Church. But for Western Europe, we see a lot of political disunity. You know, if we zoom in here on the Holy Roman Empire, take a look at all of these different political units. This used to all be unified under Rome. And so whereas we have a lot of centralized powers during this time period that rise up, we also have these regions that remain decentralized. We can't leave time period uh, three, without talking about how the Mongol Empire impacted political and economic structures. Just a uh, rapid, rapid transformation in many of the regions which the Mongols took over. Um, I already talked about how the Mongols bring with them stability. 
in terms of trade, but they also bring with them stability in terms of political structure. We can see all of these different khanates, um, these different subsections, these bureaucratic subsections of the Mongol Empire. I mean, the Mongol Empire is going to be kind of short-lived. It's like a hundred-year empire. We can see this map is from around 1294, and the Mongols start their conquests in the early 13th century. So this is late 13th century. But um, the uh, legacy of the Mongol empires is something that we can't avoid, and we'll continue to talk about that as we go through the time period. Um, I'm not going to uh, harp on this too much, because we already kind of talked about this in 3.1. I see this, this concept is a little bit repetitive. Contact between states led to technological and cultural transfers. I think a lot of this is, is really housed in Key Concept 3.1, specifically with trade. We should talk about the Crusades, the Crusades which are ordered by the Catholic Church against the Islamic world. Um, by the time you get to the, the 11th century, the Catholic Church and the Christian world are beginning to feel really threatened by the Islamic world. Islam has been around for over 300 years now. It's continue, continuing to expand, and it's threatening um, the, the Christian world. And so the Pope orders a series of crusades, it orders Christian soldiers to take up arms against the Islamic infidels as they were um, tagged at the time. And so the crusades are this really bloody time period where Christian armies being raised by these kings and lords at the behest of the Catholic Church are sweeping down into the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, aside from the bloodshed, um, which you can see in the painting there is of course significant, we also have um, cultural transfers and interactions that are happening during the Crusades too. Um, you wouldn't necessarily think it, but you have this clash of cultures who otherwise wouldn't have really interacted, maybe through trade, but you have all of these soldiers who are going to far off distant lands and who are seeing people they never would have seen before. Chinese maritime activity is another great example of how trade is facilitating cultural transfers. Um, the voyages of Zhang He, who is pictured here to the left, um, he makes a series of voyages, seven voyages, um, in the uh, very tail end of our time period, late 1300s, early 1400s, and we can see here the stops along the way of his, his voyages um, and his destinations. He actually makes it all the way to the eastern coast of Africa, on his last few voyages. This is also one of the last times that China is going to push out into the outer world. After the voyages of Zheng He, there's a new mentality in China that they actually don't want contact with the outside world because contact with the outside world brings new ideas and new ideas can sometimes bring instability. And so the Chinese emperors after these voyages of Zheng He kind of look at it and think, do we, do we really want this? Do we want new religions? Do we want new political ideas? Do we want new ways of thinking about the world? And they decide no. And so after these voyages, they actually burn as many records as they can of the voyages and destroy all of the ships. So as much as they were celebrated at the time, and uh, certainly historically, culturally significant for us today, it's um, kind of the it's kind of the last time in Chinese history until we get to the 19th century when China is being forced to interact with the outside world in really large and meaningful ways. And so that's it um, for Key Concept 3.2, a little bit shorter certainly than Key Concept 3.1 because I think Key Concept 3.2 is repetitive in some ways. And so that brings us to Key Concept 3.3. Um, if Key Concept 3.1 is mostly economic, focusing on trade, and Key Concept 3.2 is mostly political, focusing on state formations. Key Concept 3.3 is mostly social, focusing on the impact that these interactions um, and states have on actual people. So innovation stimulated agricultural and industrial production in many regions of the world. Agricultural output is increasing during our time period, which is a good thing because what we're seeing is populations are also starting to increase, although not remarkably so, not like we're going to see in time periods four or especially time period five and six. But agricultural output is increasing um, due to technological inventions like the horse collar. Horse collar had been around in the classical era, um, but the modern horse collar is getting um, refined. 
and is being put into use. Field rotation and crop rotation um, is also something that's emerging during this time. When you use the same field and plant the same crop in that field season after season, the soil gets depleted of the same nutrients over and over. People begin to figure out, oh, if we grow different things in different fields season to season, these crops will actually take out different nutrients and they will put in different nutrients too. This is still a technique that farmers use today, field and crop rotation. And uh, the demand for luxury goods increased. This is towards the tail end of our time period when this really accelerates. Um, textiles and porcelains for export in China, Persian, and, uh, Persia, excuse me, and India. The Silk Roads had been trading in luxury goods far before our time period, but as stability spreads across the region in the 1200s and 1300s, we see more trade in luxury goods. Uh, the College Board notes that the fate of cities, where people are tending to congregate, varied greatly during this time period. We see both decline and growth. And so in some urban areas, we see decline due to uh, a series of factors. Um, invasions, um, we'll talk about in a moment how invasions can actually be both decline and growth. But it's pretty obvious when you have an invasion, people are going to die and uh, buildings are going to be destroyed. So that can lead to urban decline and decay, especially if those areas are just left to rot and left for dead. Disease. The Black Death is a good example of this, stylized on the left with the map. The Black Death spreads in the mid-14th century. It is spread by rats, in, uh, in plague-infested rats on merchants' ships, and it sweeps across Europe. Uh, roughly one-third of Europe's population is killed by the Black Death, and you can see how rapidly it spreads here. We have 1347 all the way to 1350 on our map, and that's it. It spreads rapidly across Europe. And that's because people didn't really understand why it was spreading, what it was. They didn't understand bacteria or germs or anything like that. Um, and so they thought it was just kind of uh, something in the air. They didn't understand that rats were spreading it. thought it was miasma. So, yeah. But despite the fact that some areas declined, some areas also experienced uh, urban revival. And so Mongol Empire is a good example of how invasions can lead to immediate decline followed by immediate growth because the Mongols invaded and they stayed. They re rebuilt a lot of the areas that they had conquered and they unified them and this led to um, urban growth safe and reliable transport, warmer temperatures. We have a miniature ice age that's going to set in at the end of our time period. But for most of our time period, we have warmer temperatures, which are leading to better agricultural output and the greater availability of labor as well. And this basically just means that the populations are growing. This is kind of cyclical. The more agricultural output you have, the larger a population you can sustain and the larger a population you can sustain, the more farm workers and field workers you have, and so the more agricultural output you can have as well. And so that cycle builds upon itself. I should note it's building very slowly during this time period. This is nothing like what we're going to see once we get to time period five, really, where population growth is going to accelerate. Um, but it is slowly building up. It's just being uh, matched by the spread of disease since we don't have modern medicine or, or a modern understanding of disease. The growth in agricultural output is being offset by things like the bubonic plague and the Black Death. What we see in social and gender structures is mostly continuity, but there are some important changes here which the College Board um, points out. Religions such as Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam preached equality of all peoples um, in terms of social classes as well as genders. What we actually find, however, and uh, we don't need to look too far, we can just look around the modern world, is that this is not always put into practice in terms of the social structures and societies that we see. And so if we were to look across this time period, we would still see patriarchal societies, we would still see unequal societies. In some ways, we would actually see the further stratification of social classes. 
And so um, despite the fact that these religions are preaching equality of all peoples, many times they are saying people are equal in the eyes of God, which allows for inequality in the eyes of humans. And so we don't see a lot of change in terms of uh, social class structure, hierarchical structure. We still have the caste system in India. Feudalism is very hierarchical in places like Western Europe and Japan. We still see the same social classes that have existed since um, the classical era in places like China um, as well. Um, in terms of gender roles, we do see in some religions like Buddhism and Christianity allowing women to have monastic roles. Um, think like nuns in Christianity, which does give them some amount of choice um, in terms of marriage. Um, so you can become a nun in the Christian church and uh, you do not have to raise a family. You do not have to fall into that traditional gender role. Um, Sufi Islam also has leadership roles for women, um, for female sheikhs. Um, but uh, this is um, not consistent across the Islamic world. But it's important to note that there are glimmers of avenues for women to take on new gender roles, but I don't want to overstate their significance. Uh, women are still very much ensconced in the home. That is their traditional gender role, is to um, raise the children and take care of society in that way. Um, last, we do see new forms of coerced labor. Coerced labor, coerced meaning forced labor. Uh, it's kind of like a nicer word for for uh, enslavement, I guess. We see serfdom in Europe and Japan. Serfs are in many ways slaves. The big difference is that serfs are tied to the land. Slaves are often tied to another person. They are owned by another person. Serfs are tied to the land, so if ownership passes from one person to another of the land, the ownership of the serfs also passes. Serfs also enjoy more freedoms in some senses than, um, than slaves do, although, um, again, I don't want to overstate that, because if you are a serf, you are the bottom rung of the social class, and you have very few freedoms. Your life is tethered to someone else. The Mita and the Inca Empire is another good example. I haven't really talked too much about the Americas during this time period. Um, there are two empires of note in the Americas during this time period, the Inca and the Aztec, and they both come later. The reason I haven't talked about them too much is because we're going to talk about them a lot in time period four once the hemispheres become linked. The Mita and the Inca Empire is another good example of a coerced labor system that the um, the Incan peoples force on the people who they conquer. And uh, the demand for slaves also increases. It's going to increase rapidly in our next time period once Europeans begin spreading out and conquering the, the New World, the Western Hemisphere. Um, but it is still increasing. The demand for slaves is still increasing as agricultural output increases as well. Lastly, I um, just want to focus on some changes in continuities, big picture stuff which might help you for the exam. So um, classical empires have fallen, new ones have been created. We saw that uh, many of these new empires are centralized. Many of the regions of the world that had um, central unification have not been reunified. But um, yeah, that's all I have to say about that. <laughs> Migrations of nomadic peoples caused major international changes in the diffusion of ideas and diseases. And uh, the Bantu migrations are a good example of this, but also the, um, you know, the, the bubonic plague, the Black Death, uh, these inter-regional interactions, merchants being able to go further than they ever had before is le leading to um, more diffusion of, of different ideas, spread of more disease, and um, yeah. But this is all inter-regional. We have not linked to the hemispheres yet, so just keep that in mind. Continuities. Religion continues to be important and continues to spread. You might think that's kind of vague and sort of like, yeah, no kidding. But uh, we get into our later time periods in AP World. Religion does not, it sort of falls off in terms of importance. And the spread of religion stops and even reverses by the time we get to our last time period. So 
Um, if we look at where we started the course and how religions were not always codified and they were sort of regional beliefs, animistic and pagan beliefs, during our, our classical era, that begins to change as we see the growth of the, the great monotheistic religions of the world, and that's still continuing during our time period here, time period three. Trade routes continue to grow in importance. Trade is a, it's both a change and a continuity. It's a change in terms of how widespread it is and the technologies that are being used and what's being traded, but it's also a continuity in terms of what trade routes are being used. Think the Silk Roads and just the fact that trade is still occurring on a regional and now interregional level. Also, societies tend, uh, not tend, continue to be patriarchal, and this is a continuity throughout our course, um, all the way through the uh, the time period. So, when you're looking at social, um, when you're looking at social and gender norms, there's a lot of continuity to be found in this time period. So, that could be something that you want to keep in mind for uh, for an essay, possibly. And so, that's all I got. Um, that's time period three. Hopefully, these guided lecture notes have giving you a little bit of a head start on what it is we're going to be taking a look at, provided you some of the details that the College Board and myself think are significant, and hopefully it'll help in our interactions that we are having in the class. See you in school.